thank you so much, she struggled with the assurance of her salvation to the extent, now I'm a, I'm a long suffering, but I'll just be honest, she got on my nerves there at one point. I was thinking, goodness, it is not that hard, girl. I never told you that. I just revealing my inside thoughts now that, now that it's all settled. And, uh, but I like what she said. As a five-year-old girl, she asked Jesus Christ to save her, and that was enough for him. And that's it right there. All you got to do is just trust him. And, I mean, it's that simple. And that's why we make it so hard. Because we think, well, there's got to be more to it than that. There's a man that I've been witnessing to and I've shared the gospel with. And he, he just, man, he, 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 it's just not clicked with him. And he was speaking to one of my boys and they said something about being saved. And he said, what do you have to do to be saved? And they told him. And he, his answer was, there's, there's got to be more to it than that. There's got to be more to it than that. No, you just trust Christ. That's it. You just ask Christ to save you. You just trust him. It is that he did all the work. Isn't that great? When he hung on the cross, he did everything necessary. All we got to do is just accept that. Boy, that's good. And I really appreciate that. Praise God. And I'm glad you finally got that nailed down so I can stop pulling the patches out of my hair. And uh, Sasha, I, I talked to him last night. I said, ask him to do this. He said, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, I'm not really good at speaking in front of people. I said, I know. I know you want me to make some cue cards or a teleprompter saying how great Pastor Wise is or anything. And uh, he, he's really, if you, as a matter of fact, if you've never heard him speak, remember those words there. That's probably the most you'll ever hear him, okay, unless you get him talking about the Bible. He's a very, very astute young man. I'm really encouraged by our young people. Um, I know some of you may see things they do, hear things they say once in a while and think, oh, no, this next generation. I'm kind of encouraged by at least the ones I know around here because they are really getting in the Word, studying the Word. They're sharing the Gospel. They seem to be bold witnesses. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, Christian Chase back there, sometimes he'll put on a a Facebook post and I'll, I'll say, man, that guy is... He's going to make something of himself for the Lord, or the Lord's going to really use him. Sometimes he'll put a post on there, and I'll think, oh, Lord, help us. That boy's losing his mind. But I I appreciate these young people. Young people, you don't know how much an encouragement you are to your pastor, and I sure do love you. And uh, that may not mean a a hill of beans to you. It just means a lot to me to be able to say that to you. I think the world of you. Um, To get up here and sing, look, I don't take that lightly. Chorus singing this morning. Man, I enjoyed that. Uh, Miss Twitty singing, eh, it's all right. But I enjoyed. She's getting over the hill. But we still. This is young people right here. <laughs> uh, Michael playing the violin this morning. Even though it wasn't turkey in the straw, I, I did enjoy that. Man, that was real good. Job. Turn to Job. Job chapter fourteen. Listen, get your young people involved in as much stuff around here as you can. Uh, And I know it's not convenient sometimes to come on Wednesday nights and bring them to things. I understand that. and I know it's not convenient to get here early on Sunday so they can be in youth choir and all that. But especially if your children have a desire to, then man, get them involved in it. Now, I don't know that it's always good to force them into this extracurricular stuff. If that, I, I don't know. I, that could be debated. But, man, if they have a desire to, man, if they have a desire to, man, do it. Oh, but we get home so late. Look, goodness. Oh, hush. Man, I, I'll follow my boys around to the baseball fields and the football fields, and we won't get home till late. My goodness, if they want to come and sing for the Lord or do something for the Lord, I would be an outright fool to not accommodate that, uh, to get them here so they can be learning the Scripture. If they have that desire, foster it. Because, look, if you don't, that desire may fade away. And then when you decide, you know what, boy, they're, they're rebellious. I better get in church. Oh, I'm not saying it's too late, but you just create some hardships for yourself. So, man, get them while they're young, while they have that desire. 
get them in there, man. Get them in there. Uh, they're around good people. Well, except in youth choir. Uh, they're around good people. No, I'm just teasing Miss Perry. Uh, they're around good people, and uh, they can learn some great, great things. And uh, but I, I love you, young people. I'm real proud of you. All right? And I hope you keep on serving the Lord. If you don't, uh, I'm going to throw some elbows on you. All right? Job chapter 14. Let's all stand for just a minute, please. We're just going to read three verses here. You won't have to stand long. <clears throat> Job chapter 14. The Bible says, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. Let's pray. Father, would you please draw us close to you, give us open hearts, open minds to accept your word to apply it, to live it. Lord, encourage us, rebuke us. Each of us may have a different need. So Holy Spirit, I cannot meet the needs. Only you can do that. And we ask you to meet our needs. Draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Anybody ever uh, cut down a tree only to have that tree start growing again? Anybody ever done that? Boy, that just, some, that makes me mad. Uh, somebody asked this this little tree growing out here on the corner. It's Bradford Pear is what it is, right here on the corner of the building. And somebody said, wow, what kind of tree is that? And I said, that's a Bradford Pear. They said, when did we plant it? I said, we didn't. We didn't plant it. We pulled out all them bushes. There was a little twig left. And if I remember right, I, I cut down the twig that was there. And by and by, through rain and just the process of time, now it's a tree. And I'm going to cut it down again. And if I'm not careful, it'll grow again. These, um, <clears throat> not, let's see, there's azalea bushes out front here. When we cleaned out the, the, um, the bushes right out here in the front of our church building, it overgrew and we pulled a bunch of them out and, and we sprayed them with Roundup, the ones we didn't want, and we, we cut them and we dug. We did all kinds of stuff to remove them. <clears throat> but look, that azalea that was here, when we pulled it out, Speak, Lord, to thy servant here. No, okay. <laughs> that always freaks me out. <clears throat> Not when the Lord talks to me, you know, in a cell phone. But we, by and by, there'd be a runner that we didn't get. And you pull up that, that azalea and break that off. And next, you go out there a couple weeks later and you got azalea bush growing again. Think, Man, I just pulled them all out. Those little runners, they, they start growing. <clears throat> now, Job here. He, he's in kind of a downtime, uh, a down moment in his life. He speaks of how that, uh, you know, a tree, you can cut it down, the roots can be old, the stock be rotted, but if there's any life in it at all, just the scent of water. He didn't even say there was water. He said just the scent of water. Man, it'll start growing again. He said, man's not like that. Man's like a stream of water. And that water you're looking at now, it passes by. It goes, you'll never see it again. And he said, that's how, that's how it is with us. Man, I, I, I've had this life. I'm going to live. I'm going to die. I'll be put in the ground. Nobody's even going to remember me. <clears throat> you can cut down a, a, a tree trunk. And we'll see Joe changes his tune here in just a minute and just a little bit. You can cut down a tree trunk or a tree at its trunk. And in a matter of time, a sucker or a runner is going to spring up out of that trunk. <clears throat> or out of the soil close by, and the tree can grow again, and it can become a tree. Job laments that even a tree has more hope than a man. We're talking here about standing in a storm. There's going to be stormy times in your life. As Brittany spoke of, having some stormy times. All right? We're all going to have them. That is how life is, all right? <clears throat> and here's an anchor that can hold us in place, and that anchor is one word. It's called hope. Okay, we talked uh, a couple weeks ago about the anchor of knowing that I'm God's child, all right? And boy, what an anchor that is. Last week we talked about the anchor uh, of his promises and, and that faith. Just taking him at his word, my faith in him is my anchor. 
<clears throat> this week I want to talk to you about hope. Job laments that a, even a tree has more hope than a man. You ever just been beat down before? Not physically, but emotionally, mentally. Just life, it's just beat you down. You're just discouraged. You're at the bottom. You, you, I mean, you're so low you have to look up to see the bottom. I mean, it's just bad. And Job's kind of at that. Yet later, Job comes to a point of rejoicing in hope that man above all others will live even after everything else has died. He says it in Job chapter 19, five chapters later, verses 25 through 27. He says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. Boy, this is one of my favorite passages of the Bible. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my, skin's worm dis- my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Here we have Job back here saying, well, man, you can cut a tree down. At least there's a little chance it's going to spring back up again. And boy, I'm just like waters. I'm just going to be here, pass on. Nobody will ever remember me. Five chapters later, Job realizes, you know what? I have more hope than a tree does. Eventually, all that's going to be burned up. But one day, I'm going to stand before my Savior. And I'm going to see him as he is, and he's going to see me, and and I'll be there with him forever. There's another passage of Scripture that gives us hope. It's in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 20. We find Matthew here quoting from an Old Testament passage in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3. And when speaking of the Savior, uses this passage, it says this, A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. The reed here mentioned is used to illustrate something that's weak and helpless. By the way, if you'll be honest, that's us. You say, no, no, I'm strong. I'm not helpless. Aside from Christ, we are. And the sooner you realize that, the better position of strength you actually put yourself in. Okay? You know, when I realize that what Christ said was true, without him I can do nothing, then I desperately cling to him, I lean on him, I hide myself by him, and I rely on his strength, and his strength is far, far greater than my strength. This reed here, it's used to illustrate something that's weak and helpless. Uh, A reed, you may see if you're by the water's edge, reeds growing there at the water's edge. It's subject to the will of the winds and the waves. Wherever the wind and the water pushes the reed, that's the, that's the direction it bends. If the wind's blowing this way, that reed will bend this way. If it be, throw, blows this way, it'll bend that way. They're so fragile, those reeds, that if a duck were to light on it, it would snap. If a man's foot were to brush against it, it would bruise it or break it. Reference is also made to how the delicate reed is used in musical instruments. Anybody ever, in here ever play a clarinet? or a saxophone, or something like that, you had to have the reed, right? That reed is fragile, man, it's very thin. And uh, over time, it gets softer and softer from the use. Uh, the, it gets wet from your saliva. If you bump that into that clarinet or that saxophone, the part with the reed, if you bump it on something, if you just brush it against your clothing, you can break it. And once it's broken, once it's bruised, There's only one thing you can do with that reed. Throw it away. It's useless. A reed, or or the reed is weak from the beginning, but once it becomes broken, it's useless and it's always discarded. But he said not only did he talk about uh, 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 not breaking a bruised reed, he talked about not quenching a smoking flax. That smoking flax is used to represent something, once again, that's weak. It's about, it's about done. When in an oil lamp, the oil is used up, the, weak, the, the wick ceases to produce light from a great flame, and it's reduced to smoldering. 
And when it's smoldering, it just has a little life left in it. There's not much. It's about done. There's no more oil in the lamp. All it would take is a baby's breath to finish it off. All it would take would be just to barely touch it to snuff it out. All it would take would just be a slightest breeze. But while it's smoldering, there's still a spark left in it. And here Matthew, speaking of our Savior, he quotes from Isaiah 42, 42 saying that a bruised reed, the Lord, he's not going to break a bruised reed. And that smoking flax, that wick on that oil lamp that's smoking, there's, there's no more life in it for it to draw. He said, he's not going to put that out. Let me point out some things I think that we can gather some hope from here. Number one, God does not love us based on our usefulness or our potential. He did not die on a cross on the basis of your usefulness or my usefulness, of your potential or my potential. That is not why he died on the cross. He simply died on the cross for our sins because we were sinners and that's what we needed. God, he Look, he does have his Samsons in this world, don't he? I mean, he has those that, like Samson, that he fills with his spirit, and Samson raises the jawbone of a donkey and kills a thousand men. Man, that's awesome, isn't it? What a powerful man. He has those men like Samson, of, with whom he, he let the spirit, his spirit come on Samson, and Samson gets up in the night, and he goes to the gates of this Philistine city and tears the gates off the hinges, tears the post up out of the ground, carries those great city gates on his shoulders and sets them on a hill far away. That's amazing. And I love reading about that stuff in the Bible. I love daydreaming about it. I love thinking it was me. You know, as a kid, when I would read comic books, I, man, I, I would interject myself into the comic book. Or when I'd watch cartoons of Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. I, man, I'd get on the floor sometimes, maybe start crawling around. I, I, I'd act like Spider-Man. I'd interject myself into it. I still do stuff like that. <laughs> when I read the Bible, I think of Samson. I think, boy, well, I wish the Lord would give me that strength. I bet I could come up with with a list of a thousand people that need a jawbone taken to them. God has his Davids. David was young and small, yet he was so full of courage and so full of faith. I mean, look, he, before he even killed Goliath, he's out there watching the sheep, and, and here comes a mountain lion to take the sheep. And what does David do? He kills it with his hands, not with the sling, not with the staff. Here, here comes a bear out, the Bible tells us. And what does he do? He goes out and he grabs the bear by the hair on its chin. I wouldn't even grab Tyler by the hair on his chin. And David grabs this bear by the hair on his chin and kills him with his hands. Man, that's, that's a man of courage. And now he looks out and he sees this giant, this nine feet plus, big hulk of a man with a, 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 an experienced warrior. And David says, why don't somebody do something about that rascal? And when Saul says, hey, come, hey, hey, come here, man, let me, let me give you my armor. Saul was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. David's a little teenage boy. And that stuff, it, I mean, it, it's just hanging off of him. He says, look, I haven't proved those. I've never used those. I'll just use what I have. I'll use my sling, a rock, and God. And he, David, when he steps out there, the giant laughs. <laughs> am I a dog? Or, or, or am I whatever he said that you'd send this little, yeah, a dog that you'd send this little kid to me with his little slingshot? What is this, a joke? Ha, 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 ha. And David said, you better watch out, man. <laughs> Little teenage guy. Actually, his older teenage, his voice probably said, you better watch out. <clears throat> and, 
And the Bible says that David went running towards the giant. Now look, I would take the giant on with something that would shoot a couple hundred yards. All right? But David goes running. He's closing the distance. So God does have some men like that. But God also has his Gideons, who was fearful and of little faith. Who when the enemy was oppressing Israel, instead of getting a sling and rock and saying, hey, me and God, we make a majority, you know what Gideon's doing? He's hiding behind the wine press, threshing the wheat so the enemy won't take his food from him. And when the angel shows up, it startles him. Whoa, whoa, what's going on here? And the angel says, you're going you're gonna, to uh, um, lead uh, your people into freedom. Me? Oh, I'm, that, that can't happen. I'm from the smallest tribe, the smallest family in the smallest tribe. I'm the smallest guy in the smallest family of the smallest tribe. Surely there's a mistake. Then he asked God, well, I mean, are you sure about this, God? Yes, I am. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, then I need a sign. I need a sign, okay? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this fleece, I'm going to put it outside. When I get up tomorrow morning, if, if the fleece is wet with the dew, but the ground is dry, then I'll know that you mean business. So he gets up the next morning, the ground is dry, he walks out to the fleece, picks it up, and he wrings it out. Oh. Man, didn't think I ought to do that. Uh, all right, God, now if you're really serious, if you're really serious, then tomorrow uh, I'm going to leave this fleece out again tonight and tomorrow because what probably happened, the sun dried up all that was on the ground but not in the fleece. It absorbed so much water. So I'm going to leave it out here. It's still wet. And uh, uh, what's going to happen is if the ground is wet but the fleece is dry, then I'll know. Don't you know the next morning he goes out there and he steps and the ground's wet this time. He's like, oh, should have waited till the sun was out a little longer. Well, surely that fleece is still wet. And he goes and picks it up and it's dry as a bone. Really, Lord? Really, are you sure? Are you sure you want me to do this? God has those Gideons just like he has Samson and, and David. He has his Elijah's. You know, Elijah, he did some brave things, but he was not always a brave man. When he challenged the prophets of Baal and, and to, to put a, uh, an offering on an altar and pray to their God, and the God that answered by fire would be the true God, and their God, they prayed for hours, and they threw themselves on the altar, and nothing happened. Elijah rebuilds the altar of God. He puts the wood on it. He, he puts the sacrifice on it, soaks it all with water, Dig, there's a ditch around it. The, the ditch is full of water. The altar is covered in water. The offering covered in water. And he kneels down and he humbly prays a short prayer, asking God to show himself. And man, boom! The fire falls, consumes everything. And the people say, the Lord, he is God. What a, what a, a, a revival. It's amazing. And then he gets word. Now look, all the prophets of Baal, they kill them all. And then he gets word that one lady, old Jezebel, says, Elijah, tomorrow you'll be dead just like them prophets y'all had killed. Now he just stood against a nation. One woman, you know what he does? He takes off running. And when a woman's mad at you, that might not be a bad idea. Uh, he may have had the right idea, I don't know. He takes off running, he runs and he hides. Listen to what he says in 1 Kings 19.4. He himself went a day's journey into a wilderness. He ran all day and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father. I mean, God just used him in a great way and now because of the threat of one lady, he runs all day into the wilderness. He finds a juniper tree, sits under it, and he said, okay, Lord, just go ahead and kill me. Just take my life. At that point, he's a bruised reed. 
He's a smoking flax. That point when God first found Gideon in fear and of little faith hiding, that moment he was a bruised reed and a smoking flax. You see, God, here, okay, first thing, God does not love me based on my usefulness or my potential. Gideon seemed to have no usefulness, no potential. In Elijah's eyes, I, he, he, and later in 1 Kings 19.10, he said, Lord, I'm the only one serving you, and I'm not doing any good. I'm useless. Number two, God does not see me like the world sees me or like I see myself. You realize that? God doesn't see you the way you see yourself. Well, I could never be used of God. Is that what God told you? That's not what his word says. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. Another favorite passage of mine. <clears throat> For ye see your calling, brethren, <clears throat> how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now there are some wise, mighty, noble, but not many. Not many Samsons, not many Davids. But God hath chosen, oh, I like this. Brother George, this is the boat we fit in right here. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Do you hear what he's saying right here? He says, look, God chooses some people that are worldly wise. And God chooses some noble and some mighty. But there's not many like that. There's not many Pauls in the Bible. There, there's not many Samsons. There's not many Samuels, okay? He said, I, I, most of what you'll see me picking in the Bible are the Peters, all right, and the Elijahs and the Gideons and the Barracks and, and these others that, that didn't have a whole lot of faith, that didn't have a whole lot of promise, that didn't have a whole lot of potential. <clears throat> in 1 Samuel 16, 7, God had told Samuel, look, Saul, he's turned his heart against me. I'm going to take away his throne from him. I'm going to give it to another. Here's what I want you to do. Go out here to this land. Find Jesse. He has a bunch of boys out there. And one of them boys, you're going to anoint him king. Samuel looks at all the sons except the youngest. Each one he looks at, he says, man, that's a fine looking young man right there. That's broad shoulders, tall fellow, looks like an athlete, probably a good warrior. Is that the one, Lord? No, that's not it. It's not him. He goes aside. The next one steps in. Well, Lord, man, this must be, he's well-spoken. I mean, this guy's an orator. He's diplomatic. I could see him being a king. Is that the one? No, that's not. The next one comes in. Well, Lord, this one's big and strong and, and well-spoken. I mean, he's the total package. Surely this is the one. No, that's not the one. Goes through them twice. He says, Lord, you said it was one of they have another son that you're not seeing. Hey, Jesse, you got another son? Yeah, I got, he's just, a, he's just a boy. Where's he at? He's out there keeping sheep. Run, get him. Here comes old David. A ruddy complexion. Teenage boy comes in. And listen to what God says. <clears throat> but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance. This is talking about an older brother or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Evidently, there was nothing impressive about David's countenance to make him a leader. Evidently, there was nothing impressive about his size that would cause somebody to follow David. 
Evidently, there was nothing about David that would indicate that he could or would make a great king or a great warrior someday. There was nothing that anybody would look at David and say, boy, he's going to do something great one day. Not what God was looking for. That's what he found in Saul. And Saul flopped. Now look, God does not always see me as the world sees me. You've said it before. I don't see what God could use in me. Doesn't matter if you see it. God sees it. Well, I don't see anything in me that was worth saving. It doesn't matter if I see it. All it took was God seeing it. Well, I don't see how God could use me. Doesn't matter if you see it. If God can see it. Well, I don't see any talents or any abilities or or anything in that me like that in me that God could use. Doesn't matter if you can see it. If God can see it, man, some people can look. They can walk out and into a field and they can look, and they can see. There's nothing there yet. But they can see a house. I mean, they see the plans of the house. They, I mean, they can picture, boy, that house would look good right here. And because of the train, here's the kind of house it will be. And man, they can they can look at the wood, say, here's the wood it's going to take. And they can look at the wood and they can picture that house. I can't. I can't do it. All I can picture, if I'm to build something, is something that looks like something the Adams family would have put together. I can't build stuff. I don't even have that vision. Look, it doesn't matter if you can see it or not. The thing is, God sees it. God sees it. Where there's smoke, there's always hope of a fire. Man, our society, we look for the strong, we look for the wise, We look for the talented. America's got talent. Or I think it was Britain's got talent. That, what's her name, Boyle, something Boyle? Susan Boyle that can sing so wonderfully. If you look at the clip of when they discovered her, she came out just what the world would have considered a below average appearance. That's what the world would have considered. And they walk out, and you look at the judges, and the judges are like, oh, no, here we go. What do you do? I sing. What's your goal? I'd like to be the next, and she named a singer I'd never heard of. And they said, well, go ahead and sing. And son, she began to sing, and it shows the judges. Their eyes get big. Their head, they look at each other. We never would have thought that that voice was in that lady. I saw a clip of this guy, forget his name, tall, black fellow with a long, it wasn't dreads, but long braid hair, and he came out, and they said, what do you do? I sing. Oh, okay. And they weren't expecting anything from him. He began to sing, and he sounded just like uh, Frank Sinatra. I mean, he sounded just like, he's singing old Frank Sinatra songs sounded just like him and all the judges once again. <clears throat> they, he said, we, we didn't, I mean, it, really the way he looked, you thought he was going to sing some R&B, pop, rap or something. And he starts singing Frank Sinatra sounding just like Blue Eyes himself, man. <clears throat> They're like, what, what in the world? You see, the world is looking for, for something. They're looking for their ideal. Their idea don't matter. Have America's got talent, the voice, all these different looking for all this talent, for all this ability, uh, uh, for all this wisdom, whatever it is they're looking for. That's not what God's looking for. See, man seeks the strong, the wise, and the able, but the Lord comes as a physician looking for the weak and the sick. Aren't you glad? See, the, Lord, the world, they look for the wise, the strong, and the able. But the Lord comes as a shepherd that would leave the 90 and 9 in order to find the one lost sheep. The world, they, they look for the strong and the wise and the able, but the Lord comes as the righteous one looking for a hopeless sinner. He comes as an advocate 
looking for the guilty. He comes as a friend that sticketh closer than a brother looking for the outcast and the despised. He comes as the king looking for those who need a minister. You remember in the Bible, the lame man by the pool of Bethesda, he had been lame for 38 years. Laying by the pool, the Bible said that once a year, and I don't understand how it worked, but it said once a year an angel would come and trouble the water, and the first person with an ailment that got into that water would be healed. And the Lord says, listen, why don't when the angel trouble the water, why don't you get into the water? One of the saddest verses in the Bible This man had been there 38 years, and he said, Lord, I have no man. He said, I'm lame. When I see the water trouble and I'm pulling myself trying to get there, somebody that can walk beats me in the water. I have nobody that cares enough to sit with me here to pull me and throw me in the water. I have no man. Jesus said, well, would you be made whole? That's a silly question. Of course I would, but I have nobody that will help me into the water. And then Jesus gives these, these words right here. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. You know, in our human understanding, we, it seems like Jesus, when he came, he would have gone to the head of Rome. It seems like he would have gone to the religious elite, but he didn't. You find him sitting and taking company with sinners and publicans. You find him taking company with those who were weak, those who were defiled, those who were insignificant in the sight of this world. You ever get to feeling that way? You remember the story of the lady that had the issue of blood for 12 years? For 12 years, she would have been considered unclean. For 12 years, she would have been apart from her family. For 12 years, society would have looked at her as someone defiled, For 12 years, she would not have been able to touch her husband or her children. But Jesus cared. I remember the man who had been blind since his birth. Hey, since birth, he was not able to see. And everybody in society would have thought, there's no hope for him. He'll never see. Until Jesus came along. That lady, we were just talking about that issue of blood for 12 years. The Bible said she had spent all of her living to doctors, trying to find a cure. I mean, she had done everything imaginable to find a cure, and she couldn't find a cure. And no doubt she thought, it's helpless, it's hopeless. I'll never be healed. I'll always be separated from society. No doubt her family or friends said, it's hopeless. There's nothing more we can do. Oh, but Jesus said, no, no, that's a smoking flax right there. I'm going to stir a fire again. Just when we think we're at our end, a lot of times Jesus is just at his beginning. I like that hymn, Rescue the Perishing. It says, down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, tempter. Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that were broken will vibrate once more. Isn't that beautiful? Chords that were broken will vibrate once more. Hey, sometimes we get to feel like, oh, man, I, I, I just can't be used of God. I, I've messed up again, and I've, I've hit bottom again, and I, I was doing so good, and boy, I've thrown a wrench in it again. I, God's going to give up on me. As long as you're still breathing air, God's not giving up on you. Because that broken reed, what most men would take, take off the instrument, but I broke many a reed playing the clarinet. Take that clamp off, you take the reed, you chunk it in the garbage can. It's not good for anything. But Jesus says, oh, wow, there's a broken reed. I think I can use it and make some wonderful music. That smoking flax, most men would have said, that'll never be a fire again. You say, boy, I've gotten to the bottom. I thought I was at, I hit bottom before and I bounced up. Now I'm hitting bottom again. And 
man will t tend to discard us sometimes. Even close friends will sometimes be tempted to shun us and just abandon us. Even family sometimes, it seems like. Oh, but not our Lord. You see, there's an anchor of hope that as long as I have, have wind in my lungs and as long as my heart beats within my chest, God is not done with me. Peter, think of Peter in the Bible. Man, that guy was always messing up, wasn't he? I love reading about Peter. It gives me hope. He told Jesus, hey, listen, these all, all the rest of these rascals, they may leave you, but I, hey, I'll stick with you unto death. Peter, before that rooster crows, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times. No, never, Lord, I'm with you all the way, never. Yet he denied him three times. Listen to what it says in Matthew 26, 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which uh, uh, the word of Jesus which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. When he denied that third time, he looks inside, he sees Jesus. They, their eyes meet. He realizes what he had done. He goes out and he weeps bitterly. Can you imagine the, the guilt? I just denied my Savior. Can you imagine the feelings of failure? Yet listen in Acts 1.15. I mean, hey, at this point, Peter's just a broken reed. At this point, he's just a smoking flax. There's, there's hardly any fire left in him. There's, he's useless. But in 1.15, we see this. And in those days, Peter stood up. This is 50 days after the crucifixion. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Here we, see, here we see Peter. After he had denied Christ, he stands up and he proclaims the one boldly that he had denied earlier. How about Samson as an example? Samson had done all these great feats of strength, these great things God had done for him, got done through him. They shave his head. They gouge his eyes out of his head. Now he's down grinding meal. He's pushing on that, that wheel and it's turning and grinding wheel. His, uh, grinding meal. His eyes are out. He's blind. His head has been shaved. He no longer has that strength. But I love what Judges 16, 22 says. You picture him now down there. He's thinking, boy, what an idiot. What a fool I was. And he's pushing on that. That uh, handle coming out from that grinding wheel, he's pushing on it, and that thing's grinding, he's blind, and, and he's weak. The Bible says this, how be it? The hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaven. He said, Samson, I'm not done with you yet. Samson, I'm going to use you again. Samson, I'm not discarding you. Samson, I'm not kicking you to the side. Samson, I'm not done. There's still some smoke. That means there's some fire. Can I tell you something? God will not discard you. Now, we may render ourselves to a point where he couldn't use us the way he initially wanted to, but he'll never just throw you away. I believe, look, I don't know what you've gone through in here. I don't know where you're at in your spiritual walk or where you're at in life in general. Maybe you've made some stupid decisions. Maybe you've done some stupid things. Maybe you've backslidden. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you this morning that in the midst of that storm, you have an anchor, and that anchor is found in the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If I'm breathing, then God must not be done with me. Therefore, I must yield myself to him so that he can perfect his work in me. Hey, hang on. God's not done with you yet. Bow your head and close your eyes, please.